And now we turn to someone who tried to respond to those objections, a later day utilitarian, John Stuart Mill. So what we need to examine now is whether John Stuart Mill had a convincing reply to these objections to utilitarianism. She and Mill got married, they lived happily ever after, and it was under her influence that John Stuart Mill tried to humanize utilitarianism. What Mill tried to do was to see whether the utilitarian calculus could be enlarged and modified to accommodate humanitarian concerns like the concern to respect individual rights and also to address the distinction between higher and lower pleasures. In 1859, Mill wrote a famous book on liberty, the main point of which was the importance of defending individual rights and minority rights. And in 1861, toward the end of his life, he wrote the book we read as part of this course, Utilitarianism. He makes it clear that utility is the only standard of morality, in his view. So he's not challenging Bentham's premise. He's affirming it. He says very explicitly, the sole evidence it is possible to produce that anything is desirable is that people actually do desire it. So he stays with the idea that our de facto, actual, empirical desires are the only basis for moral judgment. But then, on page 8, also in chapter 2, he argues that it is possible for a utilitarian to distinguish higher from lower pleasures. Now, those of you who have read Mill already, how According to him, is it possible to draw that distinction? How can a utilitarian distinguish qualitatively higher pleasures from lesser ones, base ones, unworthy ones? Yes? If you've tried both of them, and you'll prefer the higher one naturally, always. That's, that's great. That's right. What's your name? John. So, as John points out, Mill says, here's the test. Since we can't step outside actual desires, actual preferences, that would violate utilitarian premises. The only test of whether a pleasure is higher or lower is whether someone who has experienced both would prefer it. And here, in chapter 2, we see the passage where Mill makes the point that John just described. Of two pleasures, if there be one to which all or almost all who have experience of both give a decided preference, irrespective of any feeling of moral obligation to prefer it, in other words, no outside, no independent standard, then that is the more desirable pleasure. What do people think about that argument? Does that does it succeed? How many think that it does succeed of arguing within utilitarian terms for a distinction between higher and lower pleasures? How many think it doesn't succeed? All right, I want to hear your reasons. Mill's point is that the higher pleasures do require cultivation and appreciation and education. He doesn't dispute that. But once having been cultivated and educated, people will see, not only see the difference between higher and lower pleasures, but will actually prefer the higher to the lower. You find this famous passage from John Stuart Mill, it is better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. And if the fool or the pig are of a different opinion, it is because they only know their side of the question. So here you have an attempt to distinguish higher from lower pleasures. 
So going to an art museum or being a couch potato and swilling beer watching television at home. Sometimes, Mill agrees, we might succumb to the temptation to do the latter, to be couch potatoes. But even when we do that out of indolence and sloth, we know that the pleasure we get gazing at Rembrandt's in the museum is actually higher because we've experienced both. And it is a higher pleasure gazing at Rembrandt's because it engages our higher human faculties. What about Mill's attempt to reply to the objection about individual rights? In a way, he uses the same kind of argument. And this comes out in chapter 5. He says, I, I dispute the pretensions of any theory which sets up an imaginary standard of justice not grounded on utility, but still he considers justice grounded on utility to be what he calls the chief part and incomparably the most sacred and binding part of all morality. So justice is higher. Individual rights are privileged, but not for reasons that depart from utilitarian assumptions. Justice is a name for certain moral requirements, which regarded collectively stand higher in the scale of social utility and are therefore of more paramount obligation than, it, than any others. So justice is sacred, it's prior, it's privileged, it isn't something that can easily be traded off against lesser things. But the reason is ultimately, Mill claims, a utilitarian reason once you consider the long-run interests of humankind, of all of us as progressive beings. If we do justice and if we respect rights, society as a whole will be better off in the long run. Well, is that convincing? Or is Mill actually, without admitting it, stepping outside utilitarian considerations in arguing for qualitatively higher pleasures and for sacred or specially important individual rights? We haven't fully answered that question because to answer that question in the case of rights and justice will require that we explore other ways, non-utilitarian ways of accounting for the basis of rights and then asking whether they succeed.